All right, <clears throat> so we're going to move into chapter five. We're going we're gonna to skip chapter four. We'll come back to it later, okay? But um, in chapter five, we're going to talk about some probability. Um, so in chapter one, we talked about collecting data. In chapter two, we talked about organizing data. And in chapter three, we talked about describing data. What we want to be able to, net, to do now is use data to draw conclusions. Um, in other words, we want to be able to perform inferential statistics. Right? We want to be able to draw inferences from the data that we're looking at. And um, the inferential statistics that we do relies entirely on probability. So we're going to spend, spend the next good chunk of the course talking about probability. Uh, so uh, let's get right into it. Um, chapter five is all about kind of the basics of probability. And then in chapters six and seven, we'll talk about some more specific kinds of probability models and things like that. Uh, six, seven, and eight, I should say. Um, but anyway, when we finish chapter five, that'll be the end of unit one. And you'll take a test at the end of this, uh, at the end of this chapter. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about probability. <clears throat> in probability, an experiment is any process that can be repeated in which the results are uncertain. So like flipping a coin or rolling a die or something like that. The sample space of a probability experiment is the collection of all possible outcomes of the experiment. And we use a capital S to denote the sample space. And we use this symbol, N of S, to denote the number of outcomes. Number of outcomes in a sample space. That might seem a little bit confusing, but it's really not. For example, the sample space for fl flipping a coin, S equals heads or tails. Right? If you flip a coin, those are the only two possibilities, right? Heads or tails. N of S would be two, because there are two possible outcomes uh, in your sample space. Um, we usually use capital letters like A, B, E, and so forth to denote a particular outcome. And uh, the number of ways that that outcome can occur, can occur is denoted by N of E. So with that notation in mind, then, we can define exactly what we mean by probability, right? So probability is a measure of the likelihood of a random phenomenon or chance behavior. We use the symbol P of E to denote the probability that event E occurs. And uh, P of E is the number of ways that E can occur divided by the total number of possible outcomes. In other words, P of E is N of E divided by N of S the number of ways E can occur divided by the number of outcomes in the sample space. For example, if H is the event that you get heads when you're flipping a coin, then the probability of H, right? So probability you flip heads would be one out of two <clears throat> because when you flip a coin, there are two possible outcomes, heads or tails, and only one of those outcomes satisfies the condition that you're looking for, right? It's that you have to flip heads, so it's one out of two. As another example, if E is the event that you roll a three or a four when rolling a standard, fair, six-sided die, then probability that E occurs is going to be two out of six, which reduces, of course, to one-third. But the important one is the two out of six, because this tells us, okay, when you, when you roll a die, there are six possibilities, right? And uh, the event that we're interested in looking at is the probability that we roll a three or a four. Well, there are two ways out of the six total ways, there are two ways that this event can happen, right? We roll a three or we roll a four. So two out of six, right, which reduces to one third. <clears throat> uh, here's another example. So a family has two children, but you do not know the gender of the children. This may seem kind of silly to you, but uh, as your friends get older and, and you kind of start going your separate ways in life, you'll know that like your you know that your friend has some kids, but you can't remember if they're boys or girls or whatever, right? So this is actually something that happens to me all the time. But anyway, a family has two children. You do not know the gender of the children. Determine the sample space S. What is N of S? In other words, imagine that you're in this scenario, right? And you're like, 
well, what should I, what should I bet on? You know, like, like what is the most likely scenario uh, for the gender of the children to be? And probably you would reason out that the most likely thing is that they have one boy and one girl. That's probably what your intuition is telling you. If your intuition is telling you that, then that's good news, right? That's because that's correct. Um, but what we're going to do is uh, do some mathematics to prove that your intuition is correct, right? So determine the sample space, right? So this family has two children. You do not know the gender of the children. Well, it's possible that they had a girl and then another girl. It's also possible that they had a girl and then a boy. Or maybe the boy came first and then they had a girl. And then finally, it's possible that they had two boys. So that's your sample space. What's the number of outcomes in the sample space? Well, one, two, three, four possibilities, right? So n of s is four. Now part B says, let E be the event that the family has exactly one boy and one girl. Define E as a set. In other, ways, in, in other words, in what ways can E occur, right? Well, so if they have one boy and one girl, then that's either girl boy or boy girl, right? So what is n of e? n of e is 2. Okay, so now compute the probability that e occurs, right? Compute the probability that the family has exactly one boy and one girl, right? Probability that they have exactly one boy and one girl. Well, this would be the number of ways that e can occur divided by the total number of outcomes in the sample space, right? So it would be 2 out of 4, or in other words, 1 half. So if you're in this scenario for some reason in your future life, or maybe in your current life, right? And you're like, well, what would be the best bet? The best bet would be that they have one boy and one girl, right? There's a 50-50 chance that that'll be the case. So, so there's a notice that the probability they have two girls is going to be one out of four. The probability they have two boys is going to be one out of four, right? So there's only a 25% chance they have two girls. 25% chance they have two boys, but there's a 50% chance that they have one of each, okay? Um, normally, when we're doing probability, we don't do this much work, right? Usually, we'll just jump straight to the answer. We'll say, ah, well, there's two out of four, uh, well, you know, two ways that it can happen out of four total possibilities. Uh, but this was just to show you, like, how the defin work, definition works and why the definition is what it is for probability, right? So it's the total number of ways something can happen divided by the total number of outcomes possible. Okay. Here's another, uh, another example. It says a pair of fair dice is rolled. Part A asks us to determine the sample space and then the, determine the number of outcomes in the sample space. So a pair of fair dice. So you roll two dice. Now you, it's natural to think that there are 12 possibilities, right? Because you have two dice and each dice has six sides on it. But, but there are more possibilities than that when you stop to think about it. So let's, let's write these out, okay? So our sample space. I'm gonna, I'm gonna display these as ordered pairs, right? So it's possible you could roll a one and a one. It's possible you could roll a one and a two or a one and a three and so forth. Okay, so those are all the possibilities if you roll a one, if the first die is a one. But this first die could be a two, right? You could roll a two and a one, or a two and a two, or a two and a three, and so forth. Okay, so I think probably you see where this is going, right? It's like the first die could also be a three, or a four or a five, or a six. So really, if you can imagine it, what you're gonna end up with is a, is a six by six grid, okay? Uh, and so in total, there's gonna be six times six, or in other words, 36 total possibilities here, okay? So there's gonna be 36 total possible outcomes. And I'm just gonna go ahead and write them all out uh, because I think it'll be useful for us later
So you can fast forward the video if you don't want to watch me do this. Then again, I mean, you should probably write this out on your page too, right? Whoops, five. And there we go. That's all of them. Okay, so those are all of the possibilities. N of S is 36. Okay, so 36 total possibilities. Um, okay, so let's answer a couple questions about this. Part B says, compute the probability of rolling a 3 first and then a 4. So rolling a 3 first and then a 4. Well, there's only one way that can happen, and that's this one right here. Right? This is the one where we roll a 3 first and then a 4. So probability that we roll a 3 and then a 4, well, there's only one way it can happen out of 36 total possibilities. Right? Now, on the other hand, in part C, it says compute the probability that the sum of the dice is 7. So probability that we roll a 7. Well, how many ways can that happen? Well, there are lots of ways that could happen. That could happen if we roll a 1 and a 6, or a 2 and a 5 or a three and a four, a four, three, a five, two, a six, one. And I think that's all of them, right? Anything sort of above this diagonal is gonna be like, the, this diagonal is sixes, this diagonal is fives, four, three, and two, right? And if you go the other way, then you get uh, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. Notice that they're not all equally likely, though, right? So let's finish this problem, right? Probability rule of seven, there's one, two, three, four, five, six ways that it can happen, right? Six ways that it can happen out of 36 total possibilities, right? So you can see it's much more likely that you roll a seven than, than that you roll more specifically a three first and then a four. Anyway, this reduces to one sixth, if you're interested in knowing that. Uh, okay. Uh, but yeah, if we looked at, for example, what's the probability that you roll a 10? Well, there are only three ways that can happen, and they're right here on this diagonal, right? So rolling a 10 is a lot less likely. It's 3 out of 36. So it's half as likely. You're half as likely to roll a 10 as you are to roll a 7, OK? Um, but anyway, that's that. Uh, so hopefully you're kind of getting a, a good sense for how probability works. It, it should feel pretty intuitive to you. If it feels too easy, then that's great, right? Enjoy, enjoy the easiness while you can. If it feels too difficult, rewatch the video, right? Go back, try to make sense of what it is that I'm telling you, right? But, but what it boils down to is probability is the total number of ways the thing can happen divided by the total number of possibilities in your sample space. Here are some things that are true about probabilities. These are good things to keep in mind because they help you to check your work, okay? They help you to see if your answers make sense, okay? So the first thing that should be pretty clear is that for any event E, the probability that E occurs should be between zero and one. Another way to think about that is if you think about it in terms of percentages. Like, what's the probability that something happens? Well, it has to be somewhere between 0% and 100%, right? There has to be somewhere between a 0% chance of it happening, happening, which would mean it's impossible, or a 100% chance of it happening, which means it is certain to occur, right? In fact, that gives us a way to fill in some blanks down here. And if, if an event is impossible, then the probability that it occurs is zero. If an event is certain to occur, then the probability that it occurs is one, okay? But that one should make some pretty good in intuitive sense to you, okay? So if you're doing some kind of probability and you get something like 1.7 as your answer, you know that something went wrong, right? The probability of an event occurring has to be between 0 and 1. The second thing that's maybe not quite as obvious is that the sum of the probabilities of all outcomes must equal 1. So if your sample space is made up of a bunch of little events, then if you add up the probability of each one of those events, you should get one, okay? And um, 
one way to see this is if you look at the boy girl example, uh, so example one in the notes, uh, probability they have two girls is one fourth. The probability they have two boys is one fourth. And the probability they have one girl and one boy is two fourths, right? So one fourth plus two fourths plus one fourth is four fourths. So in other words, one, right? So that's another way to check your work. Um, in section 3.5, or no, it was 3.4 actually, we defined what outliers were. Another way to view outliers is uh, an outlier is something that has a low probability of occurring. Now, what do we mean by low probability? Well, as a general rule of thumb, we will say anything, le anything that has a less than 5% chance of occurring, we're going to call that um, an outlier. Now, in order to distinguish these outliers from the outliers that we defined in 3.4, we're going to use a different word for them, and we're going to call them unusual. So we're going to say they're unusual if they have a less than 5% chance of occurring. Something else that we can rephrase in terms of probability is uh, uh, relative frequency distributions. So a, a probability model lists the possible outcomes of a probability experiment and each outcome's probability. Uh, in other words, a probability model is just a relative frequency distribution, right? It's, it's uh, the percentage of times that you would expect something to happen. Um, probability models have to satisfy these two facts, of course. Okay, so for example, in a bag of peanut m and milk chocolate candies, the colors of the candies can be brown, yellow, red, blue, orange, or green. Suppose that a candy is randomly selected from a bag. The table here shows each color and the probability of drawing that color. So there's a 15% chance you're going to draw a yellow candy and a 23% chance you're going to draw an orange candy, right, and so forth. So suppose that a candy is randomly selected from, from the bag. Um, let's verify that this table is a probability model, okay? So to verify that it's a probability model, first of all, we have to make sure that each of the probabilities is between 0 and 1. And that's clearly true, right? All of these numbers are between 0 and 1, so that condition is met. The second condition that has to be met is that the sum of the probabilities has to equal one. Well, is this one true? Let's see. We can add them up. 0.12 plus 0.15 plus 0.12 plus 0.23 plus 0.23 plus 0.15 is one. So that one's also met. So yes, this is a probability model. Okay. Uh, very good. <clears throat> so we've talked about probabilities when we know exactly what the sample and event spaces look like. In those cases, we can just say probability that E occurs is the number of ways that, that E occurs divided by the total number of outcomes in the sample space. This is called classical probability. However, we don't always know what the sample or event spaces look like, so we can't always use this formula. So when, when it happens that we don't know what the sample or event spaces look like, then we rely on evidence from experimentation to compute an approximate probability model. And um, in that case, we say the probability that E occurs is the frequency with which E occurred divided by the number of trials of the experiment. In other words, the probability of that E occurs is just the relative frequency. Um, it's the relative frequency with which E occurs. This is called empirical probability. Okay. So um, on the next page, I'm going to give you some really, hopefully really clear examples um, of the difference between classical and, and empirical probabilities. But basically, 
empirical probabilities, you get empirical probabilities when you are relying on experimentation to get the probabilities because you don't know what the sample and event spaces look like. I realize that that's probably sort of uh, abstract to you right now, but like I said, I'll give you some concrete examples here in a second. Okay, one last type of probability is called subjective probability. Subject, subjective probability is just a term that your book uses as a catch-all term for any probability that's not real probability, right? It's, it's probability that's obtained on the basis of personal judgment, right? So subjective probability is like when you say, oh yeah, I'm 92% sure that it's gonna rain tomorrow or something like that. I mean, that wouldn't be a subjective probability if you were actually a weatherman, but you know, uh, like if you say, oh, I think there's an 80% chance that uh, I'm gonna eat pizza tonight or something, it's like, uh, I mean, you're not basing that on anything really. So that would be subjective, okay? <clears throat> um, so let's look at some examples. This next example is uh, an example based on a game called Pass the Pigs. Uh, I've never played this game before, but I have rolled these pigs. So, so the idea is that uh, in Pass the Pigs, you roll some pigs. Pigs are used as dice. Right? So instead of having a standard bare six-sided die, you have these pigs that you throw, and points are earned based on the way that the pig lands. Okay? When you throw the pig, there are six possible ways that the pigs could land, but they're not all equally likely to occur. So for example, the pig could land on all four of its legs. That's called a, that's called a trotter. On the other hand, the pig could land on one of its sides. Right, So one of the sides has a dot, and the other one doesn't have a dot. Right, but those are the most likely scenarios. It's also possible that the pig could land on its back. That's called a razorback. Or it's possible the pig could land on its two front legs and lean on its nose, and that's called a snouter. <laughs> okay, and then the most rare outcome is the leaning jowler. This is when the pig lands on one of its legs and is leaning on its nose. Okay, that's called a leaning jowler. Anyway, so those, those are the possible ways the pig can land, but as, but as you can see, they're not all equally likely to occur. So this is a clear example of something where we don't know what the sample and event spaces look like. Okay, so, um, so we can't use classical probabilities to say something like, what's the probability that someone throws a trotter? Right? We, we don't know. But what we do have is some experimentation, right? We have a class of 52 students. They rolled the pig 3,939 times. And these are the frequencies with which they rolled each, uh, each outcome, okay? Part A says, use the results of the experiment to build a probability model for how the pig will land when it is rolled, okay? So remember, a probability model is basically just a relative frequency distribution. And what we're given here is a frequency distribution. So all we have to do is turn this thing into a relative frequency distribution. And instead of calling it the relative frequency, we'll call it the probability. But it's really no different than what we've than what we did back in chapter two. Probability. Okay. So we have side with dot. Or actually, this was side without dot. Side with dot. Razorback, trotter, snouter, and leaning jowler. Okay. The relative frequency. Now these pigs were rolled 3,939 times. So the relative frequency of rolling a side with no dot would be 1,344 out of 3,939. Let's see what we get. Okay, so that comes out to about 0.3 four, one, two. I'm gonna round these to four decimal places, okay? But there's like a 34.1% chance that this happens, right? So 34% so of the time, approximately, you're gonna roll a side without dot. And similarly for side with dot, right? You say 1294 out of 3939. That's about 32%. Well, about 33%, actually. So this is 0.3285. So 
so, so almost 33%, okay? Um, so I'll let you fill in the rest, right? So go ahead and, uh, and work on this. I'm not gonna show the divisions, I'm just gonna write down my answer. Okay, <clears throat> so these are the probabilities that you should end up with. Okay, part B asks us to verify that our probability model satisfies the rules of probability. In other words, we're going to check our work. Okay, so first of all, first condition is that all of these probabilities have to be between zero and one. Whoop, zero and one. And that's true, right? That's true. It's easy to verify that one. The second thing is that the sum of the probabilities has to equal one. That one requires a little bit more effort to check. Let's see, 0 0.3412 plus 0 0.3285 plus 0 0.1947 plus 0 0.0927 plus 0 0.0348 plus 0 0.0081 is one. So that one also holds. Okay, now the next question. Uh, is this classical or empirical probability? Uh, I think they're referring to this probability model here, right? So are these probabilities classical or empirical? And I've kind of, kind of given this away just in what I've been saying, but these are empirical, right? Because the pigs are not all equally, because all of the outcomes of the pigs, uh, like these outcomes are not all equally likely to occur, we couldn't use classical probability. We had to rely on experimentation in order to get these probabilities. Okay. Part D asks, estimate the probability that a thrown pig lands on side with dot. Side with dot. That's this outcome right here there's like a 33% chance that that happens, right? So we'd say probability that they land on side with dot is, a, well, it's approximately 0 0.3285. So that's just testing to see if you can read the chart that you created in part A, right? And then part E says, would it be unusual to throw a leaning jowler? Leaning jowler, that's this guy right here. Would it be unusual? Well, on the previous page we said, Anything with less than a 5% chance of occurring is unusual. And this is less than 5%, right? 0 0.0081 is less than 0 0.05, right? So would it be unusual? Yes. In fact, it would be unusual to throw a snouter. Um, however, it would not be unusual to throw a trotter, okay? This one's less than 0 0.05. This one is not less than 0 0.05. So this one's unusual, this one is not. This one is definitely unusual, right? It's a very rare thing to roll a leaning jowler. It only happened 32 times out of almost 4,000 rolls. By the way, um, they on Wikipedia, they keep a running total. Like, I don't know if they do this anymore, actually. I guess I should verify that. But last time I checked, they kept a running total. So like people just sit around throwing pigs all day and recording their outcomes. Um, but anyway, uh, yes, it would be unusual to throw a leaning jowler. Um, I'm going to skip this page and come back to it. Let's look at page six, just to give us some more examples uh, of the probability that we've talked about. Okay. So number seven says, suppose a fun size bag of M&Ms contains nine brown candies, six yellow candies, seven red, four orange, two blue, and two green candies. Suppose that a candy is randomly selected. What is the probability that it is yellow? Okay. In fact, I I'm going to let you work on parts A, B, and C. Go ahead and pause the video, see if you can answer parts A, B, and C on your own. Okay, here are my answers. Probability, probability it's yellow is gonna be six out of however many candies there are in total. So 15, 22, 
26, 28, 30. So 6 out of 30, which reduces to 1 fifth. Or if you like it as a decimal, you can call it 20%. <clears throat> Part B, what's the probability that it's blue? Probability we draw a blue candy. There are two of those, so that would be 2 out of 30, or 1 15th. And then part C asks, are the probabilities in parts A and B classical, empirical, or subjective? And these would be classical probabilities. They're classical because you know exactly what candies are in the bag. It's like you went out, you got this bag of M&Ms, you opened it up, poured out the, the candies, counted up the, the number of each color, and then you put them back in the bag, right? And shook them up and, and now you're counting. So you know exactly what the sample and event spaces look like, right? And that makes this a classical probability. Um, an empirical version of this would be something like you go out and you buy 30 bags of M&Ms and you count up each color, uh, okay? Uh, you count up each, each color uh, in each bag of M&Ms and based on that experimentation, you come up with approximate probabilities, right? You come up with relative frequencies for the different colors of candies, right? That would be empirical probability. Now, if you said, now if you said you go and you buy a, another bag of M&Ms, so a 31st bag of M&Ms, and without opening it up and counting up how many M&Ms there are of each color in the bag, you just pull out one candy. Now, what's the probability it's yellow? And if you're basing that on your experimentation with the first 30 bags, then the answer to that, that, that probability that you give is going to be an empirical probability. Okay. So hopefully that makes it clear the difference between them, right? With the classical probability, you know exactly what's in the bag. With an empirical probability, you don't know what's in the bag exactly, but you know from past experience about how much you can expect to be in the bag. Okay. Number eight. So as a manager at a pizza restaurant is considering giving Bob a raise, the manager estimates that there's an 80% chance that Bob will quit if he does not get a raise. Is this classical, empirical, or subjective? <laughs> Those are subjective for sure. The manager really has no way to know, right? He's just guessing that there's a fairly high chance he's going to quit if he doesn't get a raise. So, so this is a subjective probability. Last one, it says Steve Nash is, was, Steve Nash was one of the best free throw shooters in the NBA. If over the course of his career, he made 89% of all his free throws, what is the probability that Steve Nash makes his next free throw? Is this probability classical, empirical, or subjective? Well, we know that he makes about 89% of all of his free throws. So the probability he makes his next free throw is 89%, of course. Now, is this classical, empirical, or subjective? And the answer here would be this one is empirical. We're relying on past experience. We're relying on his performance during the time that he was in the NBA, right? During which time he made 89% of his free throws. We're relying on that experimental data to say to come to some conclusion about the probability that he makes his next his next free throw, right? So this is an empirical probability for sure. Okay, so hopefully the difference between classical, subjective, and empirical probabilities is making some sense to you. Uh, I want to go back to the previous page now to talk about how empirical and classical probabilities are related. And they're related through this fact called the law of large numbers. Basically, what the large, law of large numbers says is that the more experiments you run, the closer your empirical probabilities will be to your classical probabilities, okay? And if you think about that, that should make sense, okay? I, what I want to do is do a little mental experiment with you. So just imagine that you're kind of doing this, um, okay? So imagine that you flip a coin 100 times and that you compute the empirical probability of flipping heads after each flip, right? Now, the classical probability of flipping heads we all know is one half. We did that probability up on the first page, right? So, in fact, we can put fill in this blank down here. It says the table below shows how the probability, blah, 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 gets closer to the classical probability, which is one half, right? So the classical probability is one half. But, 
But let's say that we want to compute the empirical probability of flipping heads every time we flip the coin. And let's say that the first time we flip the coin, we get tails. Okay. So if we flip the coin once and we get tails, then the empirical probability of flipping heads is zero out of one. Right? Because we flipped the coin once and we got heads zero times. Now, if the next flip is heads, then the empirical probability of flipping heads is now one out of two because we flipped the coin twice and we got heads once. Okay. If the third flip is heads again, then the empirical probability becomes two out of three because we flipped the coin three times and we've gotten heads twice. Right. And uh, this process is, is going to continue on and on and on. So what I have here is a simulation that your book did, uh, flipping the coin a bunch of times, right? And after the first flip, the probability of flipping heads is zero. After the second flip, it's one half. After the third flip, it's two fourths. And then this goes on and on, right? Fourth flip, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, ten, eleven, twelve, and so forth. Um, now, if they do this a hundred times the probability, the, the empirical probability of flipping heads is going to start to decrease, right? It's going to start to decrease and it's going to get closer and closer to one half, which is the classical probability of flipping heads. In other words, the classical probability is the true probability. Okay, the empirical probability is the experimental probability. And the, the bad news about the classical probability is that we don't always know what the classical probability is. It's not always easy to compute, right? The good news is that we can use empirical probabilities because the empirical probability is going to be pretty good as long as your sample size is pretty large, right? The empirical probability is going to be really close to your classical probability. So, uh, so the law of large numbers basically justifies our use of empirical probabilities to approximate classical probabilities as long as the sample size is large enough. Now, exactly how large does the sample size need to be in order for us to be justified to use empirical probabilities to approximate classical probabilities? Well, that's another question for another time. It is something that we will address this semester, but we don't have enough tools in our toolkit yet to be able to answer that question. Okay, but basically it, it has something to do with how certain you wish to be that you are correct, right, in your use of empirical probabilities. But we'll come back to that later on, um, and that'll do it for 5.1, right? So there's your homework assignment at the bottom of the last page as usual.